join you here today. Thank you very much to, to the organizers for, for inviting me and allowing me to provide a little perspective about um, some, of the, some of the results that we've come up with in, in GeneSwitch. Uh, um, and specifically what I'll be talking about today is some of the, the statistical modeling developments that we've done within the projects. So we had a, a specific work package dedicated to developing genomic prediction models that could incorporate some of these functional annotations directly as a way of prioritizing variants. Um, and so I'll, I'll discuss sort of some of the, some of the work we did on, on that point and, and um, some of the challenges we've met as well in terms of moving it forward to um, industry-ready uh, uh, models. Uh, so just to start, a, a brief recap of, of GeneSwitch, if it's not fresh in your minds. Um, so uh, yeah, GeneSwitch has some similar objectives to what you've done here in Aquafung, but for the, the, the poultry and, and um, swine sectors. So similar to, to Aquafung, there's these sort of ambitious global aims about delivering underpinning knowledge about the, the functional genomes of these two species, and hopefully to enable a, trans, a translation of that information to the, to the breeding sectors. Um, broadly speaking, the, the GeneSwitch project was uh, cut into three uh, large pillars. Um, so the first that was um, focused on generating functional annotations across different tissues and developmental uh, stages for those two species. Uh, the second that was looking to insert that new knowledge into these models that I'll be describing today. Um, and then, uh, of course, uh, the standardization and outreach of the data that were produced within the project. Um, so the, the, there was a, a massive amount of, of functional annotations that were generated within GeneSwitch. So for both uh, poultry and for pigs, uh, uh, we were looking at um, three different developmental stages. So early and late organogenesis and either newborn uh, or, or hatched uh, animals and then at the adult stage. Similarly, we, we looked at two different sexes with a, a couple of different biological replicates um, in a variety of tissues that were considered to be of interest for, for the sectors. And using many of these different uh, sequ uh, sequencing assays that were described earlier this morning to look at various aspects of the, the functional genome. Um, so in particular, uh, there were RNA-seq, uh, attack-seq, chip-seq, small RNA-seq, methylation, and high c so uh, chromatin confirmation assays that were performed uh, <clears throat> in these different tissues and, and developmental stages. Uh, so as I said, there was a specific work package within GeneSwitch that was dedicated to this task of trying to do a statistical model development. Um, and the, the interesting part about this work package is not only did we have this model development, but we also looked at generating some additional uh, types of annotations um, using fine map QTL studies and, and expression QTL studies in chickens and, and, and pigs. Um, and then moving forward to, to have sort of two different levels of validation in some sense. So once the models were, were set up and in place, the idea was to first do a sort of smaller scale validation um, on a, a set of uh, data that was generated within the, the work project. So on a, a fairly small number of animals, 300 uh, pigs. And eventually to roll that out to a, a wider scale validation into commercial population on the scale of, of several tens of thousands of, of animals. So a very quick reminder about genomic prediction models. Um, as you likely know, the idea is that um, in, in a reference population of animals, we can collect uh, DNA, so sample DNA for, for each of the, the animals, as well as information about traits of interest or, or phenotypes. We can build a model to predict uh, those traits of interest with respect to the, the genotypes that were collected. Typically, uh, linear models are a common choice that are used. And then using that uh, model that's developed on our reference population, we can then roll it out onto uh, DNA data that's collected on a validation population for which those traits are not yet available, allowing us to achieve uh, predictions, those genomic breeding values, for those traits. So it's, the idea is, of course, that those genomic pre uh, breeding values can in turn <clears throat> be used for selection. So within GeneSwitch, one of the, the first tasks that we focused on um, looking at for our model building was specifically to make use of, of a class of models called Bayesian models. So broadly speaking, Bayesian models are a framework of statistical approaches where we're trying to make use of prior information, so here are prior functional knowledge about uh, functional annotations, and use that combined with our observed data to have a posterior understanding of, of what's the likeliest uh, outcome for our model. 
So there's a whole uh, family of Bayesian models that are often used for genomic prediction, it's called the Bayesian alphabet. Um, and the idea is that these are models that can help balance some sort of relatively realistic biological um, hypotheses with uh, computational times that can be longer than a, a standard GBLOP model, but still somewhat reasonable. So our idea here, as in all of these Eurofung projects, is that our functional annotation information holds promise on two fronts for these models. The first is we were hoping to see gains in prediction, so specifically improved uh, genomic selection uh, capabilities because of uh, improved prediction accuracies. And on the other hand, we were also hoping to, to achieve a simultaneous gain in interpretability. So this idea of for uprating, upweighting uh, genetic variants that have a functional role, then not only will our model perform well for predictions, but we'll back away from this black box aspect of modeling and perhaps have a better understanding of the, the true genetic architecture underlying those traits. So to start, um, the, the state-of-the-art Bayesian models that are sometimes used for genomic prediction, um, the, the most commonly used are, are Bayes-R and a, a slightly more recent extension called Bayes-RC. So the Bayes-R model essentially has this underlying assumption that our full set of genetic variants can broadly be clumped into one of four categories. A category with a null effect, so no impact on our trait of interest, and then a sort of small, medium, and large effect. And then based on this underlying assumption, you're sort of assigning SNPs to one of these categories where most of the, va the variants would belong to that null class. So there's sort of an automatic selection of what genetic variants are actually playing an important role. Um, one issue, though, is that, uh, so, and Bayes-RC is a sort of an extension that goes beyond a simple four-class structure but allows to say, okay, I have groups of, of SNPs according to known functional annotations, and I can play with the proportions of important variants according to those categories. So our issue here is, as we saw with those screenshots from the, the ensemble builds, um, we have really complex functional annotations here that might be overlapping, partially overlapping, um, that might have a direct impact on our trait of interest or not. And trying to account for these complex overlapping functional annotations was in fact our goal in terms of uh, pushing forward uh, a new extension of, of these state-of-the-art Bayesian models. Um, so this was work that was done with a, a PhD student who worked with me, um, Fanny Molanda, um, who started off from this idea of the, the Bayes-R model. So I have a very schematic uh, illustration of sort of the, the underlying hypotheses of our approach. Um, so as I said, the, the Bayes-R model essentially is going to take uh, our, our variants that we see here on the bottom of the screen, and it's going to essentially say that this set of, of variants, we're going to group it, as I said, into one of four categories, null, small, medium, large. I mentioned a second ago that the, the Bayes-RC approach uh, goes beyond uh, the Bayes-R approach in that it allows you to have a prior categorization of your variants. So a typical example could be uh, the following. Um, we might have two categories of, of SNPs that interest us particularly for a trait of interest. Um, say the, the SNPs that I've highlighted in orange here, that might be hits from a previous GWAS uh, uh, analysis. Um, and perhaps another set of variants that were flagged um, in a public database. And so what happens here is the Bayes-RC approach is essentially going to, to fit a Bayes-R model within each of those independent categories. So the, the orange GWAS hits have a, a bigger part of the, the pie chart that's going to go towards high impact variants whereas those that were unannotated are going to be much more likely to be in the null category. That's the sort of underlying idea of the Bayes-RC approach. But as I said, when we're looking at these different uh, regulatory annotations, we're most definitely going to have the, the, the case where we have uh, these situations where um, variants are annotated by several different uh, categories. And in their current form, the, the Bayes-RC approach doesn't allow you to, to account for such scenarios. So the, what Fanny did is she looked at uh, two different ways of accounting for these variants that might have multiple functional annotations, and she put them both into a, a software that we call Bayes-RC-O for overlapping annotations. Uh, the reason for having two different uh, types of models here is because we, we thought that there could be situations where there are two different reasons for these overlapping groups of functional annotations. 
The first could be that we have a bit of uncertainty about whether one function or another, or one category or another, has a greater impact for our particular trait of interest. So here um, I have a variant that's annotated both as being accessible in embryo liver and as being a, a, a flag in the animal QTL database. And I'm not really sure whether one or the other is more pertinent, but I'd like to be able to assign that variant to one or the other. And in such a case, we have a model that essentially uh, tries to, de to determine which of those annotation categories appeals, appears to be uh, the most uh, likely. That's the, the Bayes RC Pi approach, where you're essentially saying, does this variant belong to the yellow annotations that are, um, have a smaller proportion of high impact variants, or instead is it in, in the other category? So the second uh, situation that we thought could be possible is that it, it could be the case that however we've defined our annotations, we have this idea that the more annotations a SNP has, the more likely it is to belong to the model as a, an important genetic variant. This idea of, of trying to, to take account of the fact that um, overlapping information is tending to push towards a, a high impact SNP. And in that case, there's sort of a, a cumulative uh, approach that we could take where you, you try to combine the, the contribution of that variant across the, the multiple categories, so you're pushing it towards having a, a higher impact in the model. So that's the, the Bayes RCO approach that was developed within uh, our, our task in GeneSwitch. And then, of course, the next, uh, the next step after evaluating the, the model in a variety of diff different simulations was to try to determine to what extent the, these models are actually useful in improving genomic prediction. Um, so the, the first thing I'll show you here is a, a early test we did um, on some data that were uh, not from the GeneSwitch project. This is from a, a, a set of data that was collected within a nationally funded uh, project uh, within France. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, where we were looking at the predictions of, of two different traits. Um, of, of interest, so the average daily weight gain on the left and the back fat thickness on the right. Um, and what I'm showing here is uh, these, these bar char charts that are showing the, the difference that I have um, in prediction accuracy compared to a model with no annotations. So a Bayes R approach is my baseline. And I have three different uh, competitors. I have a Bayes RC model, this older model where I just chose arbitrarily a category for SNPs with multiple annotations. And the two new models I, I just presented a moment ago. And if what you're seeing is what I'm seeing, it's that it's fairly disappointing results in some sense. We have, first of all, maybe a, a slight gain in, on average daily weight gain for the Bayes RCO models, although the, the bars are quite large. But the use of annotations does appear to improve prediction slightly by a, on the order of about a, a point of correlation. Whereas for the back fat thickness trait, what we have is that the, the inclusion of these annotations from the animal uh, QTLDB appears to be about the same or perhaps even worse than if we'd used a model that didn't include those annotations. So it's a, it's a quite perplexing um, result in the sense that we, we sometimes see these modest gains in prediction for some, but not all traits when we incorporate annotations. We do see gains somewhat in terms of interpretation. So for example, the Bayes RC Pi approach allows you to go back to the, these are the annotation categories that were fed into the model. Uh, go back to those annotation categories and try to, to look at the proportions of variants in those categories that are assigned as having a high effect or a medium effect in our, in our modeling approach. So interesting, we can say, okay, average daily weight gain, it looks like behavioral uh, QTLs seem to be um, sort of a higher proportion inclusion in the model than, for example, immune capacity. And in that case, uh, it's a trait where that's, that makes some sense. But uh, again, having an, an improvement in, in interpretation that's accompanied by a sort of status quo in, in prediction, the, the actual gain is, is uh, somewhat uh, open for discussion. So just a quick overview about these annotation incorporations with these Bayes RCO models is that the, what we proposed within GeneSwitch was this idea of having two different approaches that could account for two different types of annotations um, that are included uh, as a first step. And, and really, I should say it when I say annotations, it's in the most broad sense possible. Um, and, and again, the, the conclusions we saw up to this point were that there were fairly modest improvements at best in prediction. Um, 
we saw relatively reassuring results on simulated data that the model was performing as expected in a controlled situation. But these real data predictions definitely left uh, a lot of room for questioning about the, the, the use of, of these models. Um, and one, another thing we saw is that, uh, as I said, these, these base RCO models um, are intended to incorporate very broadly defined annotations, essentially groupings of variants. And different ways of defining these groupings of variants into annotation categories can have a fairly strong impact on the downstream results. So one other thing I wanted to mention is that a lot of uh, our initial tests on these model development that we did um, were a bit difficult to do it within the context of the gene switch data because of the calendar of the project. So the model development started on day one of the project, which is also when data acquisition started. And I'm sure, similar to what you experienced in, in the Aquafung project, the model development was well underway or completed by the time that uh, annotations started to become available. So um, some of these validations on publicly available databases, QTL hits from animal QTL DB, it may be that those annotations just weren't particularly pertinent to be included in the model uh, as it was. So that's sort of one, one thing to keep in mind. What I did want to mention is, obviously looking at these results, there's this big question. So why are we seeing such modest improvements with annotations? And there, I think there are, a couple of, there are a couple of possibilities, and I wanted to just go into a, a quick investigation of, of a couple of them. So the first is, we, we started off with this idea that the Bayesian alphabet was a, a good starting point, that it offered us some flexibility in terms of underlying assumptions, but still being fairly reasonable in terms of, of computational time. So we rolled out this extension Bayes RCO. You could say, Perhaps it's just that a class of models that isn't particularly well adapted to the, to the situation. So we have GBLUP models that work quite well as it is. Um, there, there are also machine learning uh, uh, methods that are, that are available. Um, so a portion of the, the, the work package group actually looked into trying to identify whether machine learning approaches would be perhaps uh, more uh, interesting to look at than linear models. Um, and this was a, a collaboration that our colleagues at Wageningen did with the Jackson Laboratory using uh, the diversity Alpred mouse data set. So what they were looking at is trying to compare a, a standard linear model, a GBLEP, um, with a, a machine learning approach. So here, a gradient boosting machine. And what they were looking at is a variety of different uh, traits. Uh, so we have body weight at 10, 15, 20 days. Uh, I don't have fresh in my memory the, all the acronyms for the traits here. But what we see here is that uh, there's not, a, a, there's not a, a clear trend to the orange bars, the GBM model, exploding, exploding past the, the blue model, right? We have actually the case where the GBLUP appears to be doing quite well on these traits. However, when they focused on traits that were known to be uh, epistatic, that's where occasionally we do see some gains with the machine learning approach. So it seems that um, th there can be some sort of competitive, uh, competitive alternative models to the GBLEP when the, the traits that are being considered are, are affected by epistatic interactions. So that's only a, a partial look at sort of what other models could be um, interesting, but that's the one thing to keep in mind, that perhaps traits that have these epistatic interactions aren't um, performing particularly well under the Bayesian uh, Bayes RCO model. Uh, so another question we looked into within gene switch is to, to what extent the, the data we were using as explanatory data um, was, was playing a role. So up to now what I've been doing is on the explanatory side of my model is just the genotypes, right? And then I have these categories to help me bump up certain variants. Um, but we could alternatively consider cases where um, we have transcriptomic data available for, for all uh, the, the, the animals in our, in our reference population. And we look at using the transcriptomic data themselves as predictors in the model. So uh, the, the, our colleagues at Wageningen, again with the Jackson Laboratory, looked at this particular question. Um, so again, we're, we're on the same uh, mouse data set as just a moment ago. And what they were looking at is trying to compare the percent variance explained um, when only genotypes, only transcriptomic data, or the two together uh, were used for predictions. 
So we start off here with um, our body weight at 10 and 15 days um, in terms of using only genotypes. And what we see is that when we roll out using either transcriptomic data or the combination of the two, that can give us a bit of a boost in terms of the, the percent variance that are explained by our model. And the other thing that was uh, somewhat interesting is that the uh, transcriptomic data here were measured close to the BW20 trait. And what they saw is that there was a, a slight uh, improvement in the percent variance explained when the gene expression was measured close to when the, the traits themselves were measured. So there's, that's pretty intuitive, I think, um, but does suggest that using transcriptomic data uh, in practice for predictions would probably be a bit touchy. So we come back to my big question about the, the modest improvements with annotations. And there were uh, three other points I wanted to, to briefly discuss before I open the floor for questions. Um, and that was that there, there were three big points that we were wondering about. The first is, uh, are the limitations we're seeing linked to the specific traits that we have been studying? So in terms of their heritability, in terms of their underlying genetic uh, architecture and so on. Um, is the problem the annotations that we used? So once again, I was, I was looking at the, the animal QTLDB um, to pre-categorize my variants, but we now have our gene switch annotations. So it's using those molecular assays in the correct tissue at a particular developmental stage going to give us a boost uh, beyond what we saw up to this point? Beyond that, there's also the question of how you would use those annotations to specifically construct those annotation categories. So at what granularity? Should these be categorical uh, bins for our variants? Or should there be a sort of a quantitative measure associated with those annotations? To what extent do those annotations need to be specifically linked to my trait of interest? Those big questions about how exactly those annotations go from their raw format to being usable and informative for a model. And finally, um, a, a detail I passed over fairly quickly earlier in the talk is the question of resolution of genotypes. So for most of the tests I was showing up to now, we were using 60K genotype data. And the, the question here was, is it, is it the case that when we're using molecular assays to generate annotation categories, it seems intuitive that having whole genome resolution sequencing would be an important uh, counterbalance to having such uh, functional annotations. So these three questions are actually um, three that we're currently looking at. So I have very preliminary results um, to show you on this point. But the idea here was to make use of a set of data that was generated within our work package um, that was for an, uh, uh, intended for an EQTL uh, study. So these are colleagues in, in IRTA who uh, generated data on a set of 300 pigs that were uh, divided into three different breeds. And for these 300 animals, they have both whole genome sequencing data, so on the order of about 18 million SNPs, and gene expression data in three different tissues. So they did a, a first pass a EQTL results uh, analysis that, that was published earlier this year where they found a significant number of, of uh, associated variants with, with gene expressions on the order of 14 million variants that could be grouped into 26,000 EQTL regions. They found lots of interesting um, combinations of within and across tissue regulatory variants. Um, and they also found some associations that were common across multiple tissues. So our idea here, in terms of looking at uh, genomic prediction models, was whether we could make use of this data set as a sort of proof of concept um, to try to perform genomic prediction of gene expression of a couple, a handful of, of, of selected uh, genes, making use of our gene switch tissue-specific functional annotations. So for this, what we focused on is uh, two sets of annotations that were among the first uh, wave of those that were available um, among GeneSwitch, and that also seemed to us to be fairly pertinent in terms of predicting gene expression uh, values. So the first was a set of uh, ataxic chromatin accessibility data, um, and the second a set of methylation data, which had been uh, grouped by our colleagues in Wageningen into genomic regions of unmethylated, lowly methylated, or fully methylated regions. So making use of these sets of annotations with our whole genome sequencing and gene expression data, um, 
A first set of results looked at using these Bayes RCO models we developed to try to evaluate to what extent we had gains in, in prediction. Um, so what you're seeing here is box, plot, box plots of five different genes among the set that we looked at, where again, the, the y-axis reference line is the, the, the baseline for a model without annotations. And what we're, we're comparing here is a, the red boxes are those that make use of only attack seek annotations, the blue only methylation, and the green, the two together. And I, of course, what we're seeing here really echoes what I showed earlier in the talk. We have cases where there's essentially no difference in prediction between no annotations and the annotations we fed in. We have cases where there's a fairly marked improvement for certain combinations of annotations. It's the case of the, the sub T3H gene in the middle. And then, of course, cases where we do worse. So, a similar approach was to make use of a, a totally different model. So we, we tried um, rolling out the methylation annotations into a weighted uh, genomic relationship matrix in a WG blup. Um, and so similarly, what I'm showing here is a subset of results on four genes. And again, we have a, a percent relative difference with a standard G blup as our reference line. And what I'm expecting here, because it's, these are liver expression values, I'm expecting the, the yellow bars to go above zero. So if that's the case for two of my genes to the right, it's not the case for two to the left. So pretty uh, intriguing results in some sense because we, we don't have clear patterns that are coming out of this particular set of tests. They're, these are still ongoing and we're sort of um, investigating whether different combinations of, of annotation, ten, annotations can, can change the, the, the final conclusion. Um, but uh, for, for the time being, this hasn't provided us a, uh, an, an easy answer to the questions we were asking. Um, so in terms of anticipated impact um, of the, the work we've done in this portion of, of the gene switch project, um, so we've been uh, investigating the added value using functional annotations in genomic prediction. That was one of the, the big questions that you've been asking yourselves about the, the Aquafong project moving forward as well. So we expect that the, the, where functional annotations can be the most helpful is, again, once whole genome uh, resolution sequencing data are available, but we haven't gone as far as uh, having definitive uh, evidence that, that that's the case uh, in, our, in our current studies. Um, one thing we're currently thinking about is whether the integration of multiple annotation maps into a single weight or a single quantification might be an interesting way to go forward in practice, somewhat analogous to the, the FAITH scores that were proposed in, in cattle um, in, in recent years. With respect to transcriptomic predictions, so actually including transcriptomic data as predictors in the model, um, there again, it's interesting that we see that we have more explained variants and higher prediction accuracies when we have these well-timed transcriptomic data available to us. But given the cost and, and complexity of sampling transcriptomic data at well-timed moments, um, means that probably in, a, in an industry setting that would be prohibitive in practice. Um, and I, I didn't go too much into the, the steps we've done so far in our validation of commercial populations. So that's work that's also um, continuing to be ongoing within GeneSwitch. And again, we'll be making use of, of our base pair resolution annotation maps, these fine mapped uh, QTLs and EQTLs um, on a much larger scale data set than what we've worked with uh, up to this point. So I'll just wrap up with a, a couple of take home messages. So um, Gene Switch has been generating these new functional annotation maps um, and this model development for genomic prediction um, with applications in chicken and pig. Um, and as I said, we had this major focus on model development, but a real challenge again was the timing of that model development with respect to the available data. Uh, so Bayes RCO is a, a freely available software. It's available on GitHub, and if anyone has interest in trying to roll out the use of the model on your, your data, please feel free to do so and get in touch if you have any questions. Um, and finally, I, I think I'll just uh, reiterate that our, we have this idea that it seems that uh, capitalizing on annotation maps requires this whole genome resolution, so at least going towards imputed uh, genotype data. So we're in the, the final home stretch as well of, of the project. We have our final meeting in a couple weeks here. Um, so there, there likely will be continuing results coming out even beyond the, the, the final endpoint of the project. So I'll stop there. Um, the, this is work of lots of people that were involved uh, in the work package four of GeneSwitch. I've cited a couple of their names here. And there have been a couple of publications that have come out on these various aspects. Um, so feel free to check them out. Thank you.